recording at home and learning that it's a lot more work than you expected, that there's much more to it than just hitting record and getting amazing results. Recording can be a lot of fun, but problems can always pop up that can derail your session and waste your time. This video is based on the feedback I got from the viewer Pip Pris, who commented on my 13 things to not waste money on in your home studio video with this request. Another video idea, skills outside the studio you should learn, like soldering, etc. Which I think is a fantastic idea because there's so much more to this job than just setting up the mics. Let's take a look at the skills everybody recording at home needs to learn to avoid disaster when things go wrong. Number one, soldering. I can't emphasize just how important learning to solder is. This is the number one skill you should be picking up on your journey from aspiring engineer to the guy who can make shit happen. Soldering comes in handy in so many ways. Fixing broken cables, changing out speakers and guitar cabinets, wiring new pickups, fixing cold solder joints on guitars, fixing Harley Benton's crappy wiring on their active V guitar, and most importantly, building your own custom cables. You can get bulk packs of 10 pairs of XLR connectors for only 20 bucks. I'd also recommend getting a low cost soldering station instead of just a cheap iron. I got this on Amazon for 30 or 40 bucks and it's never let me down. Grab yourself a spool of bulk mic cable and save yourself a small fortune. Just remember, liquid solder is not glue. Let your iron heat up, put a small bit of solder on it, and this is called tinning up, for better heat transfer. Then be sure to heat the two items you want to bond. Put a little bit of solder on the joint, remove the iron, and let the connection cool. Then tug on it to make sure you've made a proper connection. Remember, we're trying to bond the items on a molecular level, so we need to get those molecules moving. As they cool, they slow down, and the two pieces will lock together. Above all, once you've made your connection, never, ever, ever hold the soldering iron like this and admire your work. I did exactly that at 14, and a great big blob of liquid metal dripped onto my arm, and I've still got the scar almost 40 years later. These things can be dangerous. I learned that day to treat the tools with respect. Number two, basic amp repair. This is something I had to learn the hard way that tube amps can be finicky bastards and break down at the most inconvenient times possible. I had a chance to hang out with Warren Hewitt and Cameron Webb at Cameron's studio to work on some guitar stuff. And halfway through the session, a preamp to the amp we were working with, so I had to figure out which one it was and to find a replacement. And it wasn't a 12AX7, it was a 12AT7. And I remember trying to find one at the local guitar center, but surprise, surprise, they didn't have any in stock. But here's what I love about YouTube. I was standing outside the guitar center, searching my phone, looking for somewhere to dig up this tube. And a fan of the show came up and introduced himself. Hey man, what you doing in Orange County? I explained I was looking for a tube that guitar center conveniently didn't have. And he said I should check out this electronic store about a mile down the road from where we we were, he pointed it out for me. So I drove down there and found the tube, got back to the studio, got it installed, and we went back to work. That whole session was saved by a fan, so dude, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. I owe you a beer. Now the hilarious bit was Warren and Cameron were looking at each other like, how the hell did he pull that off? And I explained to them that because Windsor is such a small city, we really don't have much in the way of amp techs. And if you can find someone who can repair yours, you'll be waiting months to get it back because they're so freaking backlogged. So you have to learn basic maintenance on your own. Changing a vacuum tube is super simple. Make sure your amp is powered down and cooled off and pull the tube out by rocking it back and forth slightly. Grab your new tube, make sure the pins line up and pop it in. Bam, you are in business. It's really that simple. Now having a spare set on hand in your studio might be a great idea because you just don't know when something might go wrong. Another thing to have on hand, keg deoxid. This is great for fixing noisy volume pots on amps, guitars, you name it. I bought this can back in 1997 and it's still only halfway used. This is what I call a great investment. Number three, time management. The one skill we all need that is never taught in schools, how to manage our time. It's almost like the powers that be want us overworked and exhausted. To get the most out of our day and hopefully put some time in on our recording skills really does require a plan. Set aside the time you need. And if you're serious, that means giving up other things like video games or sitting in front of a TV. Make yourself a to-do list and prioritize what is actually going to get you closer to your goals first and stick to it. And if you're sleeping until noon and wondering why nobody is giving you your big break, go find a mirror. Number four, 
guitar maintenance. Unless you love the idea of paying somebody to fix all your guitars, you should really consider picking up a few essential tools, like a set of precision screwdrivers, a string winder clipper, a drill bit winder for quick string changes, and a guitar multi-tool. Now, I love the one from Ibanez because it has the short hex keys, which will fit into a truss rod cavity perfectly. And apparently somebody else in here did as well because mine grew legs and disappeared. Seriously, I gotta go find another one, but it was great while it lasted. Now, being able to do your own guitar maintenance will save you some serious cash over time. Minor things like neck adjustments, fine tuning intonation. These are skills that can be picked up easily. A good rule of thumb is if your action is too high between the nut and the 12th fret, turn the truss rod clockwise to add tension. This will straighten the neck out slightly and lower the action. The strings put a lot of force on the neck and naturally want to cause it to bow. The truss rod counteracts that force and the amount of tension we apply can fine tune the amount of bow, thereby adjusting how high the strings are. Remember, when adjusting the truss rod to always have the correct size tool and never force anything. Make one quarter turn adjustments and wait for the neck to settle before adjusting again. If you strip your truss rod, you're screwed. So make your adjustments carefully and don't rush it. Now, if the action is too high from the 12th to the bridge, use the string saddles to adjust the height on them. Again, this is where having a guitar multi-tool comes in real handy because it should come loaded with hex keys that are the proper size. So you won't have to dig through a pile of them looking for the right one. Now, adjusting intonation is another seriously important skill to learn. The aim is to have the guitar able to make chords that are in tune with each other up and down the neck. Now, how we adjust this is by changing the length of the string at the saddle. Pluck a note on the open string. Tune it so it's perfect, then fret that string at the 12th and you should get a perfect octave. If it's sharp, increase the length of the string. If it's flat, shorten the length of the string. Now this requires fine tuning and patience, but you'll be rewarded with a guitar that sounds great. The trick is to keep tuning and retuning and make minor adjustments so you don't go too far. Number five, wrapping cable. Have you ever seen somebody doing this? Do you wrap your cables this way? Well, stop it already, because that's a great way to break your cables and they'll become a tangled mess of spaghetti when you store them. Let's wrap cable the smart way. Let's use the over under method. Now, I don't know who came up with this, but whoever you are, thank you. You have cleaned up my studio immensely. Now, this can seem a little confusing at first, but with a little bit of practice, you can get this down and it'll be wrapping cable in no time and it'll do it much more quickly and efficiently. So what we want to do is we want to start with the cable facing away from us in our left hand like so. Then we grab a length between our thumb and our first finger and twist towards ourselves, forming a perfect loop. And the second part here, this is the part that confused the hell out of me, is we want to take the next part of the cable in an open hand like this and make a fist and then flip towards like so. And then we just alternate. It's real simple at this point. So thumb, first finger, twist towards, open hand, fist, flip towards. Look at that. And just keep going. Thumb, first finger, twist towards, open hand, fist, flip towards. And then finally, thumb, first finger, twist. And now we've got our perfectly wrapped cable just like that, no problem at all. And then we just finish with a Velcro tie. This cable's good to go till the next time we need it. This skill works on everything. Guitar cables, mic cables, extension cords, even rope. I was working on a home improvement project with my dad a few years back, and at the end of it, we did a cleanup, and I handed him his rope back, perfectly coiled. The disbelief in his eyes. He looked at me like I was from Mars. Where'd you learn how to do that? Well, I learned it down in Nashville. How? Roping steers? No, actually I learned it from Derek from Rev Amps, helping him clean up his booth after summer nap. He was kind enough to take five minutes and show me how it's done, and it's now how I wrap my cable every single time. The only thing that makes this method better are the Velcro ties. You can get a stack of these dirt cheap on Amazon, like 100 for 12 bucks, and these will keep your cables exactly as you wrap them, ready to go whenever you need them. Now, why go to that trouble of learning this method? Simple, because we can grab this cable years down the road and it's gonna unfurl absolutely perfectly every time. We just undo the Velcro, make sure we've got the one part facing away from us, grab the other end and throw. And it just unravels perfectly every single time. There's no not, no problem. Number six, networking. I went to my first NAMM show in 2015 and it changed my life. Because I didn't just check out the gear, I attended the seminars and those are gold. Because they teach you how to navigate the music business. But the single most important conversation I've ever had in my entire life was with Rob Scowan at that conference. This is back when I only had 27,000 subscribers and he explained that he made his living on YouTube and I remember this clearly, he said, 
you're gonna do it too. And of course my reaction was, get the fuck out of here, Rob. There's no way that's gonna happen. And here we are years later and every single event I go to where I see Rob is like, hey Rob, here's your beer. Because he saw something in my show that I didn't. And more importantly though, he gave me a goal. Although it seemed impossible at the time, it wound up becoming a reality. And now I get to make YouTube videos for a living. And this is all because I went to the NAMM show and met people who were in the same situation as me. So I am forever grateful to Rob Scallon and Ryan Bruce who got me my first NAMM badge. Thank you so much, guys. Seriously, if you have the opportunity to go to an event like this, go. Make it happen. Don't make excuses, just do it. And don't just wander around the exhibits. Go to the classes. And if you're an introvert, this might seem weird and intimidating, but shake hands and meet people because you never know when you'll have the conversation that transforms your life. Seven, motivation to do it every day. Let's be clear here. There's a very good chance you're gonna make absolutely no money at all by recording. You might get to record a few local bands, but generally they have no money to pay you and they'll make your life miserable. Please see my video, 13 things to avoid when recording bands for a full rundown on this. It's lots of fun. However, for anything to happen, you do need to be motivated. In my case, my day job was so terrible that I saw working with bands as an escape from the day-to-day -day monotony of working on an assembly line. Each band had its own unique quirks and challenges, which was a nice contrast to the constant repeat of an auto work, which is, here's a few parts, put in the vehicle in under 48 seconds, now do that 500 times, and we'll see you back here for an additional five days this week. Enjoy your one day off. What a great life. Believe me, as much as I complain about bands, working with them is what kept me from losing my freaking mind. The experience of making records is what kept me motivated. Find what motivates you and use that as fuel. Yes, you'll make mistakes, but you'll learn from them and you'll get better. Yes, you'll get discouraged, and sometimes you'll even want to quit. But if you really want to do this, you'll power through it, and you'll come out better. Eight, do your own acoustics. Spending a couple of hours in a recording studio design forum can save you some serious grief in your own studio. Creating your own acoustic treatment really isn't that difficult. I did a video on it a few years back on how to build your own bass drum. It's gotten hundreds of thousands of views and hopefully I've managed to help a few people along the way. Here's the thing, you don't necessarily have to make permanent alterations to your mixing space to install acoustic treatment. Something as simple as a closet can be transformed into a giant bass trap merely by hanging shirts and spacing them out. You can also hang rigid fiberglass traps from mic stands instead of marking up your walls. And that's the thing, I always hear the argument, I can't install anything because I can't mount anything on the walls, which is nonsense. If you've got an imagination, you can figure it out. And if you can't figure it out, ask for help. The one place I've always recommended to go for help is the John Sayers Studio Design Forum. It's where I got the plans to build this place. Now, unfortunately, John passed away back in 2021, but there is still a treasure trove of great information on there and the forum's still online. Now, if you guys would like to see a video on acoustic hacks, let me know in the comments because if there's enough interest, I'll make it happen. Nine, drum tech. The sad truth about drummers is that even though most of them have problems with timing, you know, showing up on time, playing on time, paying their rent on time, almost none of them can tune their own instrument. If you want to record your drummer, you better learn how to swap out drum heads. That's provided you've convinced them that his old broken down drum heads held together by duct tape aren't gonna cut it in the studio and he needs to buy new ones. Let's be clear here, he will barely be able to change them and you can forget about him tuning them. Get yourself a drum dial and learn how to do it yourself because he won't. Put in the time and learn how to use it because placing it on a drum head and adjusting the lug so all the tensions match all the way around the drum is just too difficult for your average drummer. 10. Basic electronics. There's no getting around it. Even the most basic knowledge of electronics is gonna be a gigantic help. Like how to wire a cabinet properly by knowing the difference between a series and a parallel circuit and how that's directly related to the impedance a guitar amp sees. Like how to make four speakers into a 16 ohm cabinet or a four ohm cabinet. It's all dependent on how you wire it. Two 16 ohm speakers in parallel becomes eight, but if you put them in series with another set of 16 ohm speakers in parallel, you get a circuit that's only eight plus eight, meaning 16. Confused? Hey, I'll admit I might have gotten this wrong once or twice and maybe even accidentally fried an amp. Having some knowledge here can save you a costly trip to the repair shop. And fortunately, there's a ton of great info out there. I highly recommend looking up a few speaker wiring diagrams before replacing anything in your cabinets. A good rule of thumb is to not mess around with different impedances. And above all, do not mix and match those impedances. If your 4x12 has four 8 ohm speakers, don't swap two out with 16 ohm speakers. That is a recipe for disaster. Bonus tip, build network cables. 
Another really important skill is to learn how to make custom network cables. Not for computers, but for analog audio. Shielded Cat5 cable is the greatest, cheapest, cleanest audio snake cable you can get. It's twisted at different ratios, so the noise rejection is outstanding. It also happens to work for four channel analog audio. Not digital, not daunting but four channel analog audio. You can use network cable along with some simple and expensive breakout boxes found at Toman for really clean, easy way to hook up a lot of mics and not clutter up your studio. Get one male, one female, and you are good to go. I installed a bunch of these a few years ago. Now, instead of 12 mic cables thrown around the room, I've got these four little boxes with their own short cables going out to the mics. And learning how to build your own network cable can save you even more money because it's very cheap to get this stuff in bulk. It's really cool tech and a great and expensive alternative to the traditional mic cable snake. Check out my full video on it. All right, guys, hopefully you found the video useful. And if you've got questions, leave them below. I'll be happy to try to answer them. And if you want to learn why recording bands can be a total nightmare, check out 13 Mistakes to Avoid right here.